I'm going to tell you something. If you two never bother with me again, again the rest of my life, I ain't giving up that I can't. I can't. There's good friends of mine out of the f***ing Well, he could boy, you have to do it first. That's why I said to you before, you, you don't understand what the hell is going on. You come out from me that the boss is your boss. You ain't supposed to be alive. Because I was making an example out of you for any mother that they planted on me again. You understand? So the only reason you're still alive, don't think because we stopped. It was because that woman walked in the door. Then he would have been gone. You aren't supposed to walk away from no her. You me, and that was the worst thing you ever did. Video. Today, we are going to get into uh, rap files and what this segment is going to be for the next, I don't know, maybe two weeks is we're going to categorize uh, guys who you might not suspect were informants. There's been lots of them over uh, the history of organized crime, but there may be a couple of names you're unfamiliar with. And we will talk about Joe Bonanno and Bill Bonanno as well. Uh, but today we're going to talk about three. Uh, and the first one is Frank Lefty Rosenthal. And for anybody who's ever watched Casino, uh, you know who we're talking about. Uh, as you know, Frank was from Chicago. He was a sports handicapper. Uh, he was a Chicago mob associate. And he was a Las Vegas executive at one point. And it wasn't until the mid-1950s that Rosenthal catches the outfit's eyes. And a lot of that was because of his handicapping abilities, uh, which made the Chicago outfit millions and millions of dollars. Uh, and it's at that time that the outfit brings him into control bookmaking in Cicero, and he ends up making them millions upon millions for the mob, specifically in Cicero, uh, probably one of the most profitable bookmaking operations in the history of the mafia. Eventually, that booking, uh, excuse me, that bookmaking operation uh, would be found out by authorities and he would move on to Florida. Uh, specifically, he would set up shop in North Bay Village, where once again, it would be all systems go. Uh, eventually he would make his way to Vegas and we sort of know the story from there. And if you don't, I encourage you to look it up for yourself uh, because the information is readily available. It's not that hard to find. Uh, and I don't want to do an entire biography of who these guys were. So if you want to know all those details, 
uh, you can actually head to our YouTube page because we did do, I think, a video or at least a biography on Frank Lefty Rosenthal a bunch of different times. Uh, at least that's what I'm thinking I did. <laughs> Who knows? I, sometimes I think I do stuff that I don't do. Maybe I have, maybe I haven't, but I think we did. Uh, now, this series, uh, you know, and, and we'll get back to Frank here in a second, is going to show you that there were some guys who talked for decades, it seems. Uh, why none of this got any press and just continued to sort of stay a rumor is very confusing to me. But as I always do on this show, I come with receipts. I come with the heat. So here is what I suggest. Hit pause, run to your living room, watch Casino from beginning to end, come back here, and maybe that car explosion at the end will make more sense. Because Frank Lefty Rosenthal, in fact was a federal informant to what degree you're about to find out so as we know uh lefty rosenthal gets sent out west and tony spilatro is sent out west uh not long after just to make sure that nobody fucked with rosenthal but problems begin almost immediately with spilatro uh just kind of coming in and trying to take everything over like he's a mob boss uh, rosenthal's precision of the skim is what meant most to the mob and with tony going into casinos creating issues was gaining way too much attention chicago wanted it kept quiet and tony was wreaking pretty much havoc wherever he went and it also didn't help that uh, number two was that spilatro was banging rosenthal's wife and he was also at the same time drawing law enforcement heat eventually the gaming commission gets involved and rosenthal is basically with with a lack of better words thrown out on his ass not only did chicago lose the skim at that point but rosenthal was out of work himself uh and it's not until after rosenthal leaves the skim uh, uh okay it's not until after rosenthal leaves uh the skim and uh in Chicago finds out what's going on and in chicago immediately reacts by whacking both Spilatro brothers uh, Rosenthal survives a car bomb attempt on his life. And over the years, Chicago and Kansas City had suspected that Lefty Rosenthal might be talking because the scheme was so inventive and it was not a basic scheme. There were ways that they were funneling money and for the FD, FBI to just suddenly figure it out. That's a problem. Uh, and yes, there were wiretaps where guys were caught talking about it, but to understand, and I hate to use this legalese term, the artifice uh, for the skim, somebody had to have been given the FBI information and they would be 100% correct on that assumption that he was talking. Uh, Frank Lefty Rosenthal was an informant for decades. His code name was Achilles. Uh, Rosenthal directly fed information to the FBI that led them to be able to indict a lot of different people for skimming in several different cases, including Las Vegas itself. While we don't know how long that arrangement went on, uh, I do have some details that might shock you. According to the paperwork that I have, Rosenthal fed information to the feds about murders, including the murder of Sam Giancana and Johnny Roselli. He directly fed information to the feds about the seven burglars who stupidly broke into the home of Tony Accardo. Uh, and Accardo, in retaliation, had all seven of those burglars killed, and Rosenthal fed that information to the feds. According to FBI Index 242244579, Rosenthal told the FBI that Roselli was murdered on the orders of Tony Accardo. The reason Rosenthal, uh, the reason why he gave for the murder of Roselli is he said that, in, and I'm using quotes, air quotes here, because this is literally what's in the paperwork, that uh, Roselli had become a public source of embarrassment for the mafia and that the Chicago and that Chicago mob hitter Frank Schwaze, who is, as we know, a Chicago mob hitman and who also ran Chinatown in Chicago, is the one that killed Roselli. Rosenthal would claim that Schwaze went down to Florida with, with Vinny and Saro and two others Rosenthal could not identify at the time. According to Rosenthal, two days before the murder, Joe Ayupa called Schwaze from a telephone booth in Chicago to discuss the murder plot. While he couldn't give any more details specifically on that, many believe that this is likely what actually did go on, what actually happened. When the FBI found Roselli's body, they found, a sm they found small paint chips on his body, which would directly correlate to Schwaze because he did, in fact, use a paint truck for heists and normal day-to-day -day business. That paint truck and the physical evidence that were found at the scene of Roselli's murder matched. 
So Roselli, in fact, did know what he was talking about. So the FBI typically is looking for corroboration. And that's where all of this sort of comes into play. Now, there, uh, then there are all the murders that Rosenthal talked about. Rosenthal gave up, like, everybody. All of the names, uh, dates. Uh, Rosenthal gave up the alleged killers and the motives for those murders. Edward B- uh, Bussieri, he was killed May 12th of 1975 in Las Vegas. He was shot five times in the head in the parking lot of Caesar's Palace. Rosenthal had explained to the agents that Bussieri was trying to shake down Alan Glick, who was the front man for many mobsters that owned casinos. Rosenthal would tell agents that Tony Spilatro, Joey Hansen, and Paul Shiro pulled off the hit. Glick had basically run to the Chicago mob complaining about the issue. He wanted uh, Bussieri dead, and it was handed over to Tony Spilatro to take care of. August, uh, uh, Minacci, uh, or excuse me, Maniasi, my bad, uh, September 11th, 1975, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, was shot and killed outside of his car in front of his house. Rosenthal told authorities that Maniasi was killed on orders of Frank Ballesteri, and that Ballesteri was irate that uh, Maniasi uh, owed and was not coming full force with the money, and also that he disrespected both Ballesteri and underboss Steve DeSalvo a week before that shooting, and apparently that discussion was very public. The FBI was fully aware of Maniachi, who was, uh, because he was an, inf- uh, they knew who he was because Maniachi was also an informant. And in an odd twist, the gun purchased on the hit on Man- uh, Maniachi came from the same store as the gun purchased to- that was used to kill Sam Giancana. And it was purchased at the same exact time. Tamara Rand, November 9th of 75, San Diego, California. Shot five times in the head at home. Rand had been attempting to muscle in on Alan Glick's casino holdings, and Glick wasn't having it. Glick once again runs to the Chicago mob for help, and Harry Aylman, you guys should know who that is, with an associate, were sent to deal with the problem and dealt with it. Sam Giancana, June 19th, 1975, Chicago. Shot seven times in the head, according to Rosenthal. Joe Ayupa, James Torello, Joey Lombardo, and Joe Amato were responsible for the murder of Giancana. While Rosenthal doesn't say who pulled the trigger, he does say that it's Tony Accardo who ordered it. This is the this is uh, this one we can talk about a little bit because I don't think any of the men, you know, that he said were actually the the trigger men. And I think logically, uh, this is Rosenthal basically asserting that those that these would be the men that most likely would be involved in that when it happened. Uh, but they were not the culprits. They were just people that were associated that he could give them names of people that likely could have done it. Charlie Nicoletti, March 29th to 77, North Lake, Illinois, shot three times in the back of the head while sitting in a car. Rosenthal doesn't give a reason for the murder, but said it was sanctioned by Accardo and carried out by Harry Aylman. Raymond Ryan, October 19th of 1977, Evansville, Indiana. Bomb detonated as Ryan is trying to get into his car. According to Rosenthal, Ryan had testified against Marshall Caffiano. And Joe Ayupa, Joe Ayupa ordered his death in retaliation and that Frank Schwaze carried out the hit. Uh, let's see. Bergmers, kill, Bergmers killed January 1978 to April 78, Chicago, Illinois area. In the Bergmers case, the outfit eliminated seven, eliminated, uh, excuse me, eliminated seven burglars who connected the robbery of Anthony Accardo's residence. Rosenthal said the killings were ordered by Tony Accardo. He said the hits were organized by Joe Ayupa's former chauffeur, Jerry Caraciello. Rosenthal's tip appears to have led investigators to zero in on Car- uh, Caraciello. Phone records later would establish that uh, Caraciello had called each individual murder victim multiple times in the days leading up to their deaths. According to the FBI, they would seal his name to protect him from retaliation from the mob, and in many instances, Rosenthal validated information for the FBI, which they could corroborate through other people fully. While much of the information Rosenthal gave did help the FBI build cases and convictions, Rosenthal was never asked to testify, and it's believed that his deal with the, the deal that he had with the FBI gave the provision of, I will tell you everything I know, but I refuse to testify is that kosher. And that's exactly what happened, and Rosenthal directed them to sources. 
Now, we talk all the time on this show about a rat is a rat is a rat. Just because you don't testify against somebody, if you give information that leads to investigations and an arrest, you're a rat. Bottom line. Harry Riccobaney is a fucking rat. Known as PH599C-TE. Harry Riccobaney had been feeding the feds a pipeline of information as early as 1962. In the early 1960s, the FBI was looking for sources within the mafia in Philadelphia, and they were actually able to get to get get a hold of two informants who were inducted into the mafia in Philadelphia to talk. Those two informants were made guys, uh, men whose fathers were involved in organized crime, and they would help trace uh, a map of the roots of organized crime in Philadelphia, as well as get the hierarchy, the structure, the membership, and more. And that's going to be Rocco Scafidi. And Harry Riccobaney, but we're gonna we're gonna start with Harry Riccobaney. In 1963, they hit pay dirt when Harry Riccobaney was approached by Special Agent David E. Walker, who was assigned to the Philadelphia office. Their relationship went back all the way back to 1950, and it began in Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary. Walker, who had been closely attempting to develop Riccobaney for years as a source, kept trying. Walker would visit Riccobaney periodically in prison. He slowly would begin to get him to talk. From the paperwork that we have, Walker would state that he never asked direct questions to Riccobaney because Riccobaney viewed himself as a man of honor. And rather than create an atmosphere of malcontent, what he does is he strokes Riccobaney's ego, allowing him to feel respected, allowing him to feel like he's a man of honor, which in turn enables Riccobaney to eventually start opening his mouth. After each visit, Walker explains in FBI memos that we have that Riccobaney began to get more and more talkative. It wouldn't be, as I said earlier, until about 1963 that the door was fully open and Riccobaney began to freely discuss issues and street stuff. Now, according to Riccobaney, the mafia wouldn't care if he talked to law enforcement officers as long as he wasn't hurting anyone and that the mafia allowed its members to talk to cops regularly. That's a bullface lie. hundred percent. Not true. And what's interesting about the the files that I have is that Riccobaney refused to give information that could be used to make criminal cases against mobsters. And throughout the files, it appears he stuck to it. So he was willing to give up people, but not give them anything substantial enough to build a criminal case. But he's still a fucking informant. And you're going to find out how. So Riccobaney would explain over the years that he had been around the mafia since 1929. He explained the structure, how everything worked, the people he knew, and things that went on. And he gave details and information about conversations that he had. Another interesting facet was that Rick Baney explained that he couldn't provide information about current dealings, and that's mainly because he was locked up in prison, and that would be pretty much accurate. He said he could give up information with ease as long as it wasn't past 1952. Oh, so ratting has term limits now. (laughs) So there are two questions. Number one, why did he decide to start talking to Walker in the first place? And number two, is he a rat? And the first question, as far as why he started talking to begin with, can be chalked up to a couple of different things. Number one, in March of 63, the Pennsylvania State Pardons Board voted against commuting his prison sentence. Uh, Rick Abaney was in prison on narcotics violations and had gotten pretty much hammered at sentencing. Angelo Bruno, who had uh, friendships with politicians and within the government, uh, could help get an early release for Rick Abaney. And Rick Abaney was hoping that uh, Bruno could pull it off, but it never happened. And Rick Abaney would sit in the can another decade. The second facet as to why he began to talk was because of Joe Valachi. Because according to Rick Abaney, well, Joe Valachi talked, talk, the mafia is no longer a secret. So in my own mind, I'm not betraying anything. Bullshit. Don't agree with it. So as the months wore on, Rick Abaney began to teach the agent about the Sicilian mob history, explaining the differences in beliefs in the structures. He would do the same in regards to the Philadelphia mafia. Rick Abaney would also explain the rules of the mafia, the do's and don'ts, and the FBI already knew that because of Greg Scarpa, who had already been feeding the uh, FBI information all along. And all Rick Abaney was doing was basically corroborating what, it, what Scarpa had already told them. So in this memo, Rick Abaney explains that the organization came together 100 years ago from Sicily when peasants came together in an uprising. The mafia was spawned from that uprising. And the landowners used the mafia as their local police force. He would also go on to explain the differences between Neapolitan mafia, a.k.a. the Camorra, and explain the differences in how they acted in comparison to the Sicilian mob. 
Riccoboni then begins to name every single fucking mob boss that he knew of, starting with Salvatore Sabella to John Avena, all the way to Angelo Bruno. He explained that both Sabella and Avena had been demoted for bad judgment. He said he was shocked that Angelo Bruno had become boss because he was not an inducted member for very long prior. He explained that Bruno wouldn't last because he didn't have the acumen or the qualifications to lead. So in other words, Bruno gets made, Bruno becomes a captain, Bruno becomes boss all within a couple of years. Two, he went from captain to boss in less than a year. Uh, and it's it's interesting because we know that Rick Abaney, when he gets out and et cetera, uh, you know, is going to have problems with Nicky Scarfo, but Angelo Bruno never really shut them down for a whole lot. And it's interesting because Bruno is allowing him to function. But here you have Rick Abaney talking shit about him in prison. It's just it's very interesting. Uh, Rick Abaney later would lay out the structure, which included boss under boss, consular captains and soldiers and associates within the Philadelphia Mafia. He would go into details about the rackets and how they functioned and how they worked. He spoke at length about how the Philadelphia Mafia would have problems because the crop of new criminals didn't have the same understanding of the Mafia as their forefathers and that the new influx of members was bad for the mob. He would go on to further explain the rules had been bent and lowered to admit new members and he felt disenfranchised because of it, which is why he's talking. In other words, the standards went out the fucking window. He explained that new members were only good at making money, and he compared them to Joey Gallo and his brothers, who he said should have never been made guys in the mob. He would tell the agent that Stefano Magadino was the boss of Buffalo, and that he was a peacemaker and he was well-respected. He felt Magadino should have been the mediator between Joey Gallo and Joe Profacci, and when he was prodded about violence... Riccobaini would explain that no member could put his hands on a law enforcement official. And when Walker explained that Carmine Lombardazzi beat up an FBI agent and hadn't been disciplined by the mafia, Riccobaini was shocked. Riccobaini would explain that reporters in the press could only be hurt if they reported lies about the mafia. He would explain that the truth is the truth. But if you lie about me or you lie about us, you will get hurt. Riccobaini would actually be the first informant in history to validate and admit there was a mafia crew in Baltimore, Maryland. Prior to that, they didn't know. He explained that the Baltimore crew reported to New York City and were an extension of the Gambino crime family. The information begins to somewhat dry up after that. But here in a memo, it explains that Riccobaini supplied information from 62 through about 1968. Riccobaini gets released in 1975. It would end up going to war with Nicky Scarfo. And then he would head back to prison for the rest of his life. And as we said, there were two informants, you know, you remember. Uh, and the second one came forward in 1964, and that was Rocco Scafidi. He would be known to the FBI as PH672C-TE. And he was much more fluid and forthcoming with the FBI than anybody else. And if you know anything about the Scafidis, they had long roots into the mafia. But that rat gene gets, seems to get handed down that lineage as well. Because there's a million rats that are Scafidis. What Tommy Hoare said, there you go. And the Scafidis go all the way back to the 1920s. According to the memo, Scafidi told the FBI that he was inducted in 1950 and that the induction took place at Casablanca Nightclub in Camden, New Jersey. His sponsor for his induction was his uncle, Joe Scafidi. Also allegedly inducted was Anthony Maggio and Anthony Perella. He would explain Joe Ida, Joe Ida, Marco Reginelli, Joe Rugnetta, Antonio Polina, and Gaetano Scafidi were in attendance and gave their names and ranks within the family. He would give direct details of the making ceremony and everything that took place. According to the documents I, that, that we have, Rocco becomes a rat in late 63 or 64. He begins to cooperate while he was incarcerated at the Philadelphia House of Detention. Through channels, Angelo Bruno actually gets Scavitti the fuck out of prison, and it cost Bruno $3,000 to take care of it. Uh, as that was one of the things Angelo always tried to do for his guys. Bruno didn't really want to help him, but it was a favor for Phil Testa and Sam Scafidi. And because a lot of the reasons why he didn't was because he saw Scafidi as a fucking nut, somebody he didn't want to deal with. And the first thing that Rocco Scafidi does when he's released is he runs to the FBI office. Scafidi would tell a, a, uh, agents that after 1950, things got bad in Philadelphia. 
He was accused of stealing mob shakedown money and committing an unsanctioned murder. As a result of that, Marco Reginelli, who was the underboss and the leader of the Calabrian faction of the South Philadelphia Mafia, wanted Scafidi dead. Scafidi, according, uh, Scafidi, according to himself, called in a favor from Giuseppe Trena, who was a made guy back in New York City. And as a result of that, Trena interceding in the problem, the hit was called off and Scafidi was put on probation. In other words, he was fucking shelved. And he would be excluded from business for almost till 1960. Ten years. They shelved him for ten years. And in 1960, Bruno allows him back in, and he was readmitted in a ceremony that allegedly took place at the Buckeye Club in Philadelphia. His new sponsor would be Ignazio Denaro, who was the new underboss of the Philadelphia Mafia, according to Scafidi. All senior members of the hierarchy of the family were there and gave the feds the names, the ranks, and of each man in attendance. According to Scafidi, two men who were made at that meeting were Frank Narducci and Frank Mar uh, Monte. And one of the first things the, the FBI does is they place a bug inside of Scafidi's apartment. The bugging operation didn't produce really a whole lot, and so therefore the bugging expedition would stop. The FBI wanted intel, and the, this was like the first time the FBI ever used like bugs in houses. This this, this is the first case. Uh, the FBI wanted intel, and Scafidi would explain that when he got out of prison, he went to work at a nearby luncheonette, where Bruno told him to work to get off to to basically get parole off his back. Next door to that luncheonette was a barber shop where Angelo Bruno and Ignazio De Niro took meetings every day. Through his information, the FBI installed bugs in both the luncheonette and the barber shop. Scafidi would also give feds information about the car Bruno drove. And the FBI would install a bug inside of the car. Once again, this is one of the first times they ever put a bug inside of a car. They would also plant a recording device on Rocco Scafidi himself. And the first time that Scafidi wears a wire is when he has a meeting with Anthony Polina. Uh, Polina on this wiretap complained for 40 minutes how everyone in Philadelphia treated him like shit. He couldn't get any respect. He complained saying that he made Bruno a captain and now look at what's happening. I put this motherfucker in his seat. And all that did was it, it proved that Bruno had only been a captain for a year before becoming boss, which backed up what Scafidi had told them. Uh, and it also backed up what Rick Abaney had said. More information came tumbling in from recordings between Scafidi and Ernest Perricone. Scafidi would check in with the FBI almost every day. And within a short period of time, he gives up everything he knows about the mafia in Philadelphia to case agents. He, like Harry Riccoboni, gave the feds everything lineage-wise, like how Sabello was the first boss and sent to Philadelphia by Giuseppe Trena of the Gambino crime family in the 20s. He gave up information about the Sicilian faction of the Philly mafia and the Calabrian faction of the Philadelphia mafia. A lot of people don't know there's two, there were two factions. Uh... You know, and at the time, Joe Regnetta ran the Calabrians and Gennaro Ignazio handled the Sicilians. He would give up his own family members, too, which included Gaetano, Joe Scafidi, Dominic Festa, Frank Barriali, Antonio Polina, Michael Maggio, John Scopoliti, and Mario Riccobaini and Harry Riccobaini. He explained the kick-up and how that worked, where the money went and how. He complained basically in the same way that Riccobaini did. The new members were not required to kill and that the new influx of the group were stale. It's through Scafidi and his memos that we see something interesting. According to Scafidi, Bruno and Denaro didn't like one each, well, didn't like each other at all. Denaro felt that Bruno was bringing, in, bringing too much heat into the family and he wanted Bruno to step down. And Denaro actually goes to New York and sits down with the commission members to explain his issues. But Carlo Gambino refused to do anything about it because of his friendship with Bruno. Scafidi furthermore gave the FBI a map of a burial ground for mob murders in New Jersey and explained that his father and uncle were hitmen. Scafidi would name Russell Buffalino boss of the Lucchese crime. This is hilarious. He names Russell Buffalino the boss of the Lucchese crime family, which was not accurate at all. But because the FBI was so henpecked on the information that they were getting, and they wanted to use the name Buffalino Crime Family as its own entity. But they didn't because they knew the information was wrong. But yes, the Buffalino Crime Family was its own entity, but this motherfucker told them the wrong area. Scafidi told agents that Carl Savella, who was brothers of Nick 
from Kansas City was going to take over the Genovese crime family after the death of Vito Genovese. And it just shows how, in some ways, rats give information, but then they lie about other shit, too. It's just, this is the best example of it. And this is why I always say, you got to read paperwork. you got to follow the trial paperwork and follow the trail. While both were informants, by any standard you want to set forth, Scafidi was different because he actually recorded guys. He gave up everything. And in this genre, we talk about rats all the time, and a rat is a rat is a rat. But there's no chain of command in rat hood. Anybody who gives up information about their friends or a group in any capacity, regardless of attaining convictions or not, is a fucking rat. In terms of the streets. All right, so that's where we're going to end today. Next week, we're going to do Joe, Bill Bonanno, and we got some more rats coming. So stay tuned on Mob Talk Radio when we come back. The Philadelphia Mob War Part 2.